on that necktie, strap wing tips on my feet. Got to find a reason, reason she was wrong. Got to find a reason the client's money's all gone. Always on my iPad, always got Wi-Fi. I can play this jury like a motherfucking riot. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this edition of the Justice Team Podcast. Today, we have the honor of having Bobby Shukla and Marianne Gallagher. And today, we're going to be talking about employment law, how things are going to change post-COVID, talking about maybe some new laws, new way people are structuring their office spaces. So first, I'm going to introduce Bobby Shukla. And we share a first name, you know, both Bobby with a Y. So That's right. Are um, you named after a Bollywood movie as well? <laughs> no, you know, unlike you, I did not, you know... Didn't wasn't an Indian raised in Brazil and then came to America. I'm just a mutt from Pittsburgh, and my dad's name was also Bob. So <laughs> there's that. But it's rare. Like usually, you know, I'm the only B O B B Y, just like you. And I get called Bobby when I'm in trouble. So, <laughs> um, but Bobby Shukla is coming to us from the Bay Area, and she is a very well known, respected employment lawyer in that space as well as nationally. And you know, she has. Two wonderful kids, was pregnant with her boy when she started her own firm, you know, what, four years ago, Bobby? Is that what it was? That's right. Yeah, and has won multiple awards for her fight for civil justice for people in the employment arena. And no stranger to that plight is Marianne Gallagher, who I'm a big fan of. Um, (laughs) Has her own practice for how long now, Marianne? 15 years? 15 on my own. (laughs) And, you know, she won trial lawyer of the year from Calo, which is one of the hardest things to do. And she's the, I think, the only woman in the past... 50 years to win that award? Two, Chris, Chris Bagnoli and me, two people. Wow. Yeah. And, wow. Awesome. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's an organization with some 5,000 trial lawyers. And, you know, and I remember the year that you had won, I think there was two or three employment verdicts that were very difficult cases that you took them to the mat and absolutely crushed them. Um, and, you know, do you carry inspirations? I know you come from a big family too. I think you're one of seven. I'm one of seven out in the middle. <laughs> Man. So did you ever get lost? Were you marrying in the middle like Malcolm was? I was out in the middle. I, that's why I think I talk so fast is because I have to get my words in with all these five brothers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think that's, uh, I make that joke all the time with my wife. She's like, why do you talk so fast and eat so fast? I was like, because I'm one of five. <laughs> you know, like my parents used to throw large pizza on the table. And if you didn't eat, you didn't eat. Right? <laughs> So uh, first question I'm going to throw out to the both of you, you know, do you see, I first want to talk about this independent contractor path, right? In California, we have, you know, AB5, we just saw Proposition 22 come down. And people's trying to go towards the independent contractor route when they're really employees. So how how do you carve through that, that fight? And can you give us some instances or some things that our listeners and watchers can look for whenever people are trying to classify themselves as independent contractor and you need to know these are really employees that are being taken advantage of. So, you know, it really goes down to how you do your work and how much control you have over your schedule, including start time. Um, the A big factor is do you exercise independent judgment in the work you do or is it being controlled by someone else are you sort of given a project and then allowed the freedom to complete it within you know your own sort of parameters more or less or are you largely controlled by the employer and how you complete it and that's kind of the big picture overview but I have to say you know Prop 22 was a big disappointment for employee rights lawyers like myself and Marianne and um it's a, it's a challenge now, you know, when you have these lobbies, it, it was, as we all know, the prop that was, um, they spent the most money on in the history of California and it worked because of that power behind it. And so, you know, there are ways to challenge it and then, and we've done that as employment lawyers for a long time, but it's, it felt like, um, the, the challenges are getting bigger because of these lobbies. Yeah. Marianne, you have anything to add? I agree. I mean, I wish I was sad when that passed. The thing that I, the thing that's important for employers is making sure that you can show that they had, they met the requirements, that they had their own discretion, that you provided them all their, the like their hours, and you controlled what they did during the day. That's as long as you're setting that up along the way, you're fine. 
I find, I think the Labor Commission is much more stricter on employers and much more favorable to the employees on that question. So if you have an issue, always have your employee go to the Labor Commission first, and they'll be more likely to find that he's an employer and give them a little ruling. Then you can go on with your employment case. Because that's a great that's a great tip, Marianne. So so walk us through that process for our listeners. Like how do they how do they get how do they get there? Oh, it's simple. It's uh, there's a labor commission online site. You go online, you fill out like a one page form, and you say, "I was uh, I work these days, and I was misclassified as a employee for the." All you have to do is like put in the days, and then they figure out how much money you're owed. And your penalties. They send a nasty letter to the employer that they have to respond within 30 days. They do discovery, like go on, ask questions of the employer, and then they may have a hearing. Uh, the employer may end up paying. If you're still employed there and you get retaliated against, then you have a great case. But I love, I think it's a great way to start the ball rolling and put the employer on the offensive in this time when we're kind of our restrict of our tools that we have normal, you got to think out of the box and out of boxes. Send your employee to the Labor Commission. They will get on it right away. They will ask all the questions. They'll ask for all the documentation. And if the employer doesn't have it, they're going to be more lenient to say, he's an employee. How does that play out in the um, the discovery phase? Like whenever you use the Labor Commission to do some of your early discovery and the letters going back and forth, I mean, are these things admissible? Can you rely on that? Can you call in the Labor Commission? Uh, I don't know if you could call the Labor Commissioner, but I, you could call the people that responded on behalf of the employer. It's usually an HR person and ask them all about it and like their responses and stuff like that. There's, um, it's, uh, it's kind of up in the air as to like for an administrative, if you're on unemployment and you do EDD and you get approved of it. The administrative ruling isn't allowed. Like you can't say, hey, I got this money as a collateral source, but you're, the employer is going to be scared as can be because they know you're coming after them and they know that the labor commission is coming after them, which is pretty scary. And if you get one employee, then the whole domino effect could happen. So it's just, a, I think we were stripped of our power. It gives us a little bit of power back with the labor commission on our side. And Mary, could, do, you, you, do you wear your red duck tailors to trial? No, I, I wear them when I walk up the courthouse because I'm two blocks away, and then I put my shoes on. <laughs> yeah. So, Bobby, what are some things you know? As you know, as an employer, are there any um, insurance policies you know that one could buy to protect them against um, any type of you know lawsuit? You know, if, if if they do wrongfully terminate an employee, or if there's an independent contractor they misclassified, is there anything that will protect them so that? the wrong consumer can have a path to insurance paying. That'll protect the employer? Correct. So, you know, I, how many of your cases, you know, when you're, are, are you having insurance companies pay? And how many times is it the individual business that the one is paying? You know, it really varies. And it's a good question. It often depends on the size of the employer. But um, it's not always insurance that's paying. And I know that's often the case. Um, I think if we get a personal injury, which I don't do any of. But um, it, I would say, you know, there's EPL, EPLI. Um, but often... What does that stand for for our listeners? Employment, can you Prices, have me liability. Liability insurance. And so, I mean, but often um, I've had, it, not unusual at all, that the check comes straight from the employer and not insurance. And, you know, describe just for our listeners the, the fee shifting statute and how that plays in. With um, discrimination, retaliation cases. Yeah. So how that works is um, the civil rights statutes, which all the discrimination, retaliation, harassment um, laws are based on created a fee shifting t so that there's a public policy that supports anyone being able to get a lawyer if they've been wronged on the basis of a civil right like discrimination, harassment, retaliation. And um, that allows you that if you go through trial and win, the defendant pays your lawyer's attorney's fees um, and costs. Um, the beauty, too, of that is there was up until, um, I can't remember, maybe 2015 when the Williams versus Chino Valley um, Supreme Court, California Supreme Court case came out, that um, if you 
lost as a fee had um fee has a fair employment housing act the california law that protects on these grounds if you lost as a fee have plaintiff you could still be um uh, the defendant could still go after costs so not fees but this could still go after costs which is a big huge risk for any plaintiff and so there was a recent supreme court case that stated that they cannot unless it's a frivolous lawsuit which is a high standard as we all know so this create this creates a big you know um part of our legal system that provides lawyers to individuals who wouldn't be able to afford one um and incentivizes lawyers like marianne and i to be able to take on these cases because we might get the full payment of our fees if we go through trial and win and throughout the case of a trial the value increases with more um, attorney time in it which is very different from other kinds of cases that don't have the, the fee shifting yeah so i'm going to pose a different topic to you marianne so just using common you know what's going on in the common day right now so let's say that it was a month or two ago you know businesses were still having restrictions due to COVID, you know, how many people can be in the space and say an employee has, you know, a, a condition that doesn't really allow them, you know, an underlying condition that makes them more prone to injury. Can the employer force that employee to come to work physically and be around others? And what are the ramifications? No, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's two statutes. So it's interesting, the federal statute, which was a CCFRLA, CCFRA, covered up until December of 2020. That expired as far as like payment and protection. And then now they put into an emergency one that's good through September of 2021. And it basically says, if you can work remotely, the employer should allow them to work remotely up until 2021. If they can't work, work remotely, like if they are too sick or if they're taking care of somebody sick, the children's uh, coverage still works if they can't care for their children. Now, as of January, they extended it now. So from January 2021 to September 2021, both in California and uh, under the Federal Act, you're entitled to two weeks of paid leave. So let's say you can't come into the office, you have an underlying health condition, and for some reason you can't work remotely, then you get this two weeks, but it's only two weeks. And you, that's, you get tax credit for that at the end. So I encourage everybody, I, I do it. It, it, it applies to people that are having their COVID test too. So if your employee has a COVID test, pay them for the time that they're out for their test. If they have effects from the COVID test, pay them for that. And it's all covered under both the California and the federal statute, which has been extended. The, the best way I say to walk through COVID as an employer to protect yourself from it being involved in the lawsuit is the simple thing my kids were learned in grade school. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Pay them the money for when they're off and you will save yourself so much money. But the employees are protected. They're very much protected. So that, and that's the reason. they don't. We don't want them to have to come to work. If they do have to come, come to work, if they shouldn't. We want them to get vaccinated. That's their choice. Um, and the, a the EEOC recently said that vac having a vaccination requirement at work is not a violation of the ADA. You can have a requirement that the employers be vaccinated. Whether How do you enforce it? That's gonna be up in the air. That recently just came down. They're just saying it's not, it's not a, it's not a uh, protected constitutional right. So there's, there's no like, there's no like HIPAA violations to ask your employees whether or not they're, they're vaccinated? Um, they say you're allowed to, let me, let me check because I just looked at that earlier. I don't think you're allowed to ask if they're vaccinated, unless, you're not allowed to ask if they're vaccinated unless you have a reason, no, this was the issue. If they ask for time off for vaccination, you can't ask them if they got vaccinated unless you see them at a park and you're like, hey, I was paying you for that time when you're not there. But other than that, it's no one's like, no one's talked about the HIPAA versus the COVID vaccination because it, to me, it all went out the window. We're all walking around going, yeah, I was vaccinated. Like, that's the first thing that comes out of people's mouths. So I don't think that's going to be a standard the employer is going to be held to. I, I had all my employees. I just told them, go, you know, take it, don't take off time from work. Get vaccinated during work. If you're having problems, make sure you take the time off. And I just have them fill out a simple one-page form that says, you know, I was off this day and the reason and then you have it like, and then you send it in. And you have to designate that day. If you're doing 
COVID vaccination pay. There's designation for that. Yeah, if you're yeah. doing, they can't come into work because it's COVID and they're sick. There's designation for that. So you got to make sure when you're talking to your payroll people, tell them which one it is. We're seeing a lot more companies shift to having some sort of hybrid, even out of COVID, where employees are going to be working virtually if they can coming to the office, maybe splitting office space or switching desks. What are some things that as an employer should be taking care of for those employees that are working virtually? Yeah, that's a good question. And then just to piggyback a little on the last vaccination question, because that's just a big topic. Um, the DFEH also recently um, issued some guidelines and they're, they're pretty thorough. Um, so, you know, the DFH is the EEOC counterpart of California. And, um, and that question is really interesting too, is like, can you ask them if they're vaccinated and what Marianne was saying, you know, now I think these agencies are saying you can require vaccination as long as you're following the discrimination laws where you are accommodating for disability and accommodating for religious beliefs and going through the process that's required to, to see if you can reasonably accommodate that. But very fascinating developing area. Um, okay, what do employers need to know about employees working virtually from home? Some interesting things are um, paid sick leave. Paid sick leave laws are governed by cities. They vary. So San Francisco has a different one from Berkeley, for example. If you're in employees working physically from Berkeley, those are the laws you're going to have to follow, even if your office is in San Francisco, because it depends where they're working. So that can get really complicated. That's one issue. So if like, I know people, I mean, have, you know, remote workers that are in Ohio or Kentucky. So how, I mean, they're crossing now state lines. I mean, it gets start to get a little I don't know. What do you think, Marianne? I know that within California, you know, it's governed by the city, but I don't, what's Ohio's laws? It would depend. I think for the state, like that, you can, like city to city, I can see they might have differences, but I think for the state of California, if you're a California employer, you've got to follow the California laws. That's kind of the same thing with truck drivers. If you're, even if you guys got, got truck drivers driving all over the country, they still have to follow the, follow the wage and hour laws in California. Speaking of truck drivers, I mean, my dad was a truck driver. I know the industry a bit, and it just seems like they constantly misqualify a lot of these people as independent contractors when they're dictating where they're picking up the load, how they're going to do it, yeah. their schedule, everything. I mean, do you, have you seen a lot of, you know, tr have you represented a lot of truck drivers or seen this as well? Because I, I mean, I see when I talk to my dad. I've not represented truck drivers in a, I have represented, um, FedEx drivers in discrimination lawsuits, but not in a uh, classification issue. Yeah. So another one for you, Marianne. So coming out of COVID, you know, we're starting to shift hopefully towards more routine jury trials. Um, and I would expect coming out of this that it is going to be a very exciting time because you pick a lot of juries and try a lot of cases. It's a very exciting time to be a trial lawyer representing employees against employers. So you're shaking your head yes. Can you just tell some of our listeners why you're excited? I, I tried the cases in the 80s when you walk into the courtroom during OJ time and they hated plaintiff's attorneys. Like you walked in and it was like, you were the plague. I spent my jury time, half of them just saying, please don't hit me. I don't hit me, Clay, because of what I do. Now <laughs> it's going to shift. It's going to be a wonderful shift for two reasons. Number one, all the, all the people in the jury are going to know what it's like to go without a paycheck. To know that fear of I've had a job for all this time and now I don't have a paycheck. That the emotional distress damages, I think, are going to be much more real to them. They're going to live it. So that's number one. Number two is with all the other things that were changing in our life, Me Too and Black Lives Matter, the, we've had a shift of, again, people are more uh, connect more with the claim of discrimination. They can connect yeah. more with the feeling of it's going to really help our emotional distress damages. We're going to have, I think the 2020 juries going forward are going to be much more uh, compassionate and much more connected to emotional distress damages than they were when we were like cracking and screaming and yelling to try and get emotional distress damages, uh, emotional distress before. I love it. I think it's, I think I'm looking forward to going back. I can't wait back into the courtroom and start talking to the jurors about this. It's going to be great conversations that we're going to have. You know, the question I asked Bobby earlier, you know, what are some things an employer can do if you have a, you know, a, an employee that's going to be mostly remote? Like, do you have to pay 
for their internet? Like, what are some yeah. things? Yeah. Reimbursements is big. Yeah. You have to pay for their internet. You have to pay for, like, if they need laptops. Like I said, the best thing to do is to try and supply them. But uh, whatever, the, whatever you're required to have to do your work, the employer has to provide it for you. That's another great area. Again, if you have a case or if you're, if you're a person that is looking, start at the Labor Commission and they'll help you out. Or if they come to you and you're like, okay, I, I'm, this might be a bigger case if I can prove that this was wrong and I can get more people, start at the Labor Commission and build your case that way. Bobby or Marianne, do you think there's going to be any new um, you know, niche areas of employment law coming out of COVID that people really weren't paying attention to and might have more momentum coming out of it? One thing, and I'm not sure if it's exactly a niche, but um, the idea of working from home as a reasonable accommodation is going to explode in disability law because, you know, um, it was always a potential reasonable accommodation, but it's one that employers um, historically resisted because people always want their employees where they can see them. They presume they're not working when they're at home. And now the fact that people have worked from home for a year, it's presumptively reasonable that they can do the job from home if they need to do that as a reasonable accommodation. And I think that's going to be a really big development and jurors are going to be very open to, you know, if that's denied as a reasonable accommodation. Jurors are going to be very open um, predisposed to believing you can do your job from home, you know, if it's a job that's on a computer, that kind of thing. That's a great point, that's true. Yeah, and because I just think, you know, uh, you know, in our practice in law, you know, specifically, I just always thought it was so archaic to require, I see some firms now, they're requiring all their employees to come either, uh, even under COVID, to do these things. And it's, you know, to me, it's like, well, why? Because a lot of it, maybe one or two days a week to make sure things get out or to have that social interaction. But if, why, if you can't do it at home, what's the problem? And so are there any things that are overstepping for an employer for monitoring employee pro productivity? Like, can I put up cameras all over their house? <laughs> can I guess, do what, guess what the answer is. To that. Yeah. What about, what about doing uh, keystroke monitoring? Ooh, what about doing, that. and then, you know, we, we just saw, you know, with the California State Bar, when they did the remote one, they actually had face recognition to make sure you were there the whole time taking the test and not moving. Oh. Yeah, it, like, when is it going to be too intrusive, right? I mean, so, you know, any thoughts on, on this type of stuff? Because I didn't think about it until right now, to be honest with you, but. No, there's yeah. a good point. I, that, this is all burgeoning, opening up wall that's going to be addressed once the COVID gets under control and everybody feels comfortable, then they're going to start looking at these other issues. And do we return people back to work? Do we do remote? Are we going to have laws that govern remote access? Like you're saying, that's, I think that's an area that definitely is going to, it's going to be privacy. It's always privacy versus the employers. Uh, it's always the financial justification or the need, the financial need that they have. That's what they really balance it against. That's exactly right. And, and it's going to be this balancing, right? It's always about balancing. Yeah. And Bobby, for your the cases that you handle, what are the the types of cases? If you had to look at like a pie chart, like what are the ones are your bread and butter? What does most of your inventory look like? So I um, really do mostly discrimination, harassment, sexual harassment, or otherwise. You know, it can be race based harassment, any kind of protected activity, uh, protected characteristic harassment, retaliation, and whistleblowing. So. Those cases are really my uh, wheelhouse because the ones I'm most passionate about. And I almost exclusively sue under state law because um, the Fair Employment, Fair Employment and Housing Act, which we call the FIHA, is so expansive. I think it's the most employee-friendly law in the country. And so I am happy to um, enforce it any chance I get. Well, do you think, you know, doing whistleblower cases, do you, have you been, you know, seen any more cases that are being more prevalent now or people more willing to speak up about whistleblower issues, you know, practicing where you are, if you can give us any examples? Because sometimes some people that are listening don't realize when they may or may not have an employment case. That's a really good point. And so the whistleblower, traditional whistleblower case is usually under the labor code. Um, and so many things can be whistleblower because the, the law that's really... Um, the main whistleblower law, though there's some more nuanced uh, specific ones, covers anything that an employee um, 
reports, even to their own manager, it doesn't have to be outside of the employer, um, that they have a reasonable belief that is um, against the law. So that can be anything. That can be a safety issue. That can be, you know, I think that I'm an auditor in a bank and I think the way this violates some kind of really specific accounting principle. I mean, it, it can, all of those things, it could be that I something that implicates that someone stole because there, if, if there's a public policy that underlies the what they're complaining about that they believe, you know, is against the law, um, that, that covers you as a whistleblower. And then if you're retaliated against for that, and then if, there can, if there's a showing of causation, then um, you've made your case. Yeah. And thankfully, you guys aren't here in person because I had street tacos out back and I had onions on my tacos and I could smell my breath. <laughs> Y'all are welcome for doing that. That is not a protected activity. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just check in. Uh, and how about for you, Marion? Like, what is your what is your bread and butter? What are most of the cases that you handle? Um, and what are some things that you're starting to see now that might people might cue them when they hear in their mind, "Hey, this might be a good employment case." The the two areas I think people need to know most about are on the sexual harassment cases. You the law has been extended so that you can file. Actually, we're arguing it applies to all cases, discrimination and sexual harassment. The law has been extended so that now you have three years, starting in 2020, three years to file your DFH complaint. You used to have one, now you have three. So if the bad act happened, if you're still working there, if you got terminated for sexual harassment, within three years, you still have a claim. That is the most important thing that people need to know, is they can still come to seek help. I love sexual harassment. I love my sexual harassment cases. I tend to do a lot of uh, women that are uh, either on, like assembly line workers, janitors. I love these, that class of women who are so underprotected out there in the world. Spanish speaking women working at night to take care of their kids. I do a lot of those cases. So that's my, my heart. That's where my heart goes. Um, just to tie in again on the COVID related issue, that's going to open up an area because that's under, there's a um, labor code section that protects you if you're making a complaint about something that's about safety of workers. So if you're complaining, I don't think my boss is making me come to work when I shouldn't, or I'm sitting next to this guy who's coughing, or I'm afraid of getting COVID, and you get fired or you get retaliated, you're protected. And it, the, and the other important part on that is you don't have to know for sure that, it's a, that it is illegal. You just have to report something that you feel is harmful to other employees or that the employer is doing wrong. And all through the case, you never have to show it's illegal. You just have to show you had a reasonable belief that it was. So don't be afraid to speak up. I always tell my employees, what's the worst that can happen? You're gonna get fired and you're gonna have a great retaliation case. They're gonna <laughs> anyway. Well, spoken like a lawyer. Spoken like a lawyer. <laughs> But how, what, how do they report it? So like, what are the best, if you're an employee and you feel like you're being mistreated, what are, what are the avenues that you have to do? Always send it, always do it in writing. In writing. Email to HR. HR. CC yourself. I've had, back in the fax days, I've had cases where they said faxes, they don't have the faxes. So always CC yourself on the email to show that you made the complaint. And then I, I say, I think the most protected employee is one that makes the complaint. Because the employer is stupid if they fire you within a year. Some do, but I think you're really protecting your job. You're helping out your other fellow workers, and you're also protecting yourself for at least a year because it's 1102.5 is one year. So always do it in writing, always email, always keep you know track of it. And don't let your employer bully you because it takes courage to be a whistleblower. It takes courage to stand up and say, I'm going to risk my job, my money, like my paycheck to do this. But you, if you feel something's wrong, do it. You're so absolutely protected. And I think people are afraid. I don't know if I am protected. I don't know if I complained about the law. Yes. Even if you, just if you have a belief in your heart that it's wrong, you stand up, you are protected. Now you get fees for these cases under the labor code where you didn't before. So, so the attorneys get their fees, just like in the FIHA cases. So let's, let's, let's shift and talk a little bit about course and scope. Okay. So if we're going into this more hybrid model of remote employees coming to the office a few days a week, where's that distinction going to be drawn if you're working from home and you have to go run, get a sandwich or going to go pick the kids up from school? What's that going to look like? Going to and from still implies that you, you're not, they're not liable if you're going to and from work. That was the old law. 
So I think that's, I think it's going to be your work hours. So if you're working and you ran out to get lunch and you hit somebody, are you covered? I think you're covered under if it's within the work hours, as long as it's not going to and coming from. But uh, if you're doing personal errands during, it's going to, like I said, this is going to be a huge area that's coming up. If you're doing personal errands while you're Zooming and you put on your free screen and you run out and you get something, then you're going to get, and that's not going to be covered. I think we have, it's funny because we have these old, old notions of course and scope that have been around forever. And now they're going to be challenged by new technology and there's going to have to be some massaging and some working on them to, to make them work. But I, this is all fascinating. I think. So what's going to happen if you got to go pick up your kids at three o'clock, you're technically still on the clock. Maybe you took your break earlier in the day, but you're still checking emails and doing things. Maybe you went to go get to McDonald's after that with the kids and you come back and you hit somebody. Is that course in scope? It's going to come down to the factual issue of what were you doing at the, like, were you right. actually doing something for the benefit of your employer or right. were you not at the time that you had the accident? It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be some crazy stuff going on out there. Way more money though. Absolutely. More than ever. More than yeah. ever. Yeah. And I, you know, I think the under, the undertow notion here is you have to protect the employees, right? Because they're, they're in a vulnerable position. So Mary, when you were talking about, and I asked you this, so Bobby, do you speak Portuguese? It was my first language. It's the language I speak the worst now. <laughs> um, yeah. And then my second language was Hindi. And then I uh, learned English. And English is by far the language I speak the best now. <laughs> so do you, uh, do you ever find, you know, different um, people from different origins or different ethnicities that tend to be discriminated against the most or the ones that are afraid to speak up the most are the ones that you represent? I know Marian talked a lot about you know, some of the ones she did. How about you? Yeah, I mean, and I, I share the passion with what um, Marianne was saying, with particularly women in scenarios where they're either um, low income earners, because that, as we all know, takes away a certain privilege that higher income earners have to be able to challenge things that are happening at work, because you may not need that job as much as someone who makes more money and has more money in the bank. Um but people who, I think it is very culturally based who feels comfortable complaining and who doesn't. And some cultures, including, um, you know, I come, I'm Indian American, I come from the continent of Asia. Often Asian um, workers don't complain as overtly as open and you have to kind of, like um, Ariane was saying, encourage people to be courageous and and speak up and um and stand up for their rights i think they're that's a very cultural notion of whether you should do it and the risk that it involves and whether you should take the risk um and so i also find you know in terms of like who's discriminated against the most i mean it, it's hard, obviously i don't know i'm not a sociologist but you do see it over and over again. Certain groups are like African Americans are still, you know, a group that faces a great deal of discrimination compared to other groups. Um, um, Latinx folks do as well in California. And so you see that a lot. And then I've also noticed a lot of um, Muslim people face a lot of perceptions of discrimination in, in the work that I do. So that answers your question. Marion, how about, um, how about political affiliation? Can employers just fire people because you voted for somebody? I mean, where's the line? That's your constitutional right. So no, no, they can't discriminate <laughs> against you because of that. It's not covered under FIHA though. But I would say, um, I haven't had a case against that, but it, it probably would have been more be before the prior election at that time than <laughs> it is now. So, um, but no, you have a constitutional right to your political affiliation. Yeah. And like I saw that, you know, they had a classification of, you know, what is a protected class and somebody was complaining that it wasn't their political affiliation, wasn't a protected class. And really, you know, whatever, but that just popped into my head. So, you know, what are some other things that, you know, yeah, as we're coming out of this, do you do any type of, you know, counseling to other lawyers and tell them, hey, here's some things to look for as we're coming out, you're getting these calls, you know, I just do... I do injury cases, I don't do employment, but I hear a lot of, hey, I just lost my job, or hey, I think I was fired inappropriately, or hey, they wanna offer me a severance, what do I do? What is the next step that we should say? I always tell them, if you're gonna make a decision, make it as if a lawsuit, don't think about a lawsuit, or do I have a lawsuit? Your life comes first, what's best for you at this time in your life? 
Do you need the money? Do you need the severance money? Is it going to take care of you for what you do? Because we can't guarantee what's going to happen in a lawsuit. So I always have them make your, your life choice first. I'm not your lawyer. I'm your best friend. And tell me what you would do. We don't know whether there's a lawsuit or not. That's like number one, because lawsuits take time. And especially now with COVID, they're extended longer. So it's not a guarantee that you're going to get paid and it's a little bit longer. So you want to make that decision up front. Uh, we sit down and I'll, if it's something where I'm like, okay, this is a pretty good case. I don't think you should take this money. I'll try and encourage him to do that. But if their life tells them at that point in time, I really need the money, I'm fine. Just, I say, do that, do whatever, whatever you need for yourself is to guide you. But so that's the number one thing. I, like I, I've never seen <laughs> maybe once or twice, like a fair severance payment. Usually, I mean, usually it's like a month or two. It's like crap. It's crazy. So I, I'm usually telling them after they make their choice, they tell me what they want to do. I'll tell them my choice and this is why you should do it. So that's how I how we do it that way. You have any cl- clients that are lawyers that were unfairly terminated? Oh, shaking your head. This is interesting. <laughs> I've definitely had lawyer clients and it, um, it's, you know, it's everything you expect. <laughs> so you know, I, we were, um, I'm a, you know, Marion, like you, I'm a big TV binge watcher. So first I'm going to ask you, what you're watching. But before I get into that, dude, we binge watched Mad Men during the pandemic. And I was like, this is outrageous. It was great, great show. Fantastically done. But I was like, this shit would never fly. It's so funny when you watch that. You're like, oh my God. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so what what shows are you binge watching right now? Uh, This is going to sound funny. I'm watching Felicity. I didn't watch it when it first came out. And it's such a cute show. It's really good. So I'm watching like funny ones. And Handmaid's Tale. I'm like on two opposite ends of the spectrum. So there's, but Felicity is like, I do it while well I'm doing my, it's just interrogatories. It makes me crazy. So I watch Felicity, kind of keeps my mind like on another plane while I'm doing it, you know, these employment long interrogatories. Well, how did you shift into Felicity? What, were you watching the Americans and wanted to go over to Felicity? What happened? I watched the Americans yet. I was I was oh. watching. What was that? I was watching another. Oh, I was watching Younger. I I binge watched Younger for a while, and then I got into that loop on Netflix. I guess with the younger people uh, videos. So that's how I got locked into that. So I love I love I love it. That's really cute. And my kids are in college, so it makes me feel like I'm, I'm living through. I went to college, but I'm living through college now <laughs> as a younger kid's eyes. Wow. So, Bobby, how about you? So, what were what? I mean, what do you do with your spare time? What seven and a three year old now? I mean, how old are your kids? Seven and three. That's right. Uh, mm-hmm. You have free time. <laughs> I mean, no, but um, I'm a big fan of comedy, stand up comedy, also sketch comedy. So, if I watch things, I don't get into really shows as much, but I um, watch a lot of comedy specials. And um, when things open up again, that's one of the first things I'll do is see live comedy. That's so good. We are, we're getting- I think Chris Rock is the most genius stand-up comedian. I love him. Like he's, he's kind of like Carl Douglas. He's such a great He's brilliant, and he's got great presentation. It's he's so I love watching. Him. Marion, listen to his Absolutely. listen to his early early stuff when he was first doing it, and see how it changed. How he worked on his dictation and deliverance. <laughs> it got so much better. Um, you know, we're reaching the tail end of you know this show. So first, Bobby, can you tell everyone how best to reach you, and then we'll go to Marianne for people that are just listening, not watching. So what's the best way if they wanted to reach out to you with any questions or if you want to take a case or if it's a someone that was wrong, what's the best way? You can email me at bshukla at shuklalawfirm.com or call my office. I have a wonderful um, paralegal who you'll reach first, and then you can always reach me through uh, her, and the number is 415-986-1338. Marion, how about you? Uh, for people that are out there that are listening, they should know we don't charge anything. Like you talk, you call us, you don't have to pay anything. That's just the way that it is. And you never have to pay anything ever. We get it from the employer. So don't be afraid to call somebody. It's free. Or you're going to get free information. And for lawyers out there that want to refer cases, Bobby and I, she's up in San Fran. I'm in LA. Just send them on out. We love doing it. Yeah. So to reach me, it's a uh, mail, just like mailbox, M-A-I-L at M-P-G hyphen law.com. That's my email. Or you can go on my website, mgallagherlaw.com and you can find me. And then my phone is 213-626-1810. And we have all Spanish speakers here, Spanish and English speakers. With me. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, thanks for coming on for all of our listeners and viewers. I invited in 
two phen phenomenal trial lawyers who I personally refer cases to in the employment, you know, world. So, you know, these are people that I trust. So I wanted to hear from the best of the best and people that take it from inception all the way through trial, you know, and, and what is the best advice you can give a young lawyer right now that wants to start, start doing employment law? Bobby, your first best advice. Best advice is talk to lawyers who are doing it like Marianne. And I, I know, um, especially if you're a, a woman lawyer, I found that other um, women lawyers that have more experience than you want to help you and want to help you get trial experience, want to help you um, learn how to find, you know, identify a good case and pursue it with everything you got. So reach out to me. That's my best advice. How about Marianne, best advice? I agree with Bobby. Reach out to somebody that knows somebody. But for the lawyers out there by yourself, don't be, I could say, don't be afraid. When you're starting your first deposition, we were all afraid. When we tried your first case, we were all afraid. It took me like 10 trials before I thought everything that could happen to me could happen to me, including my skirt fell down once when I stood out. <laughs> so like everything that could happen to you is going to happen. You're going to survive. So the rule I tell my kids for life is if it doesn't kill you, do it. So when you're starting out as an employment lawyer, if it doesn't kill you, do it. Ask the question. Do it. Don't be afraid. That's probably the best I can do. And then call us and we'll help you. And, you know, just the mentorship. And I just want to thank you for, you know, mentoring all of the young solos at Justice HQ, helping them with their cases. And I'm a big believer in outsourcing to specialists, being into your space. And you two know this space better than anyone. And, you know, any young solo that wants to reach out with any questions, please do. It's an open book for them. They have virtual chat rooms. They'll be able to talk to you, walk you through it. And they're even way more fun in person. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, thanks for uh, listening to this edition of the Justice Team Podcast. Media at justiceteam.com if you have any questions. And remember, no sleep till justice. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>